Well, Razorback fans, yes, spring football has actually been going on, and there's actually been some interesting things about it, and we're actually going to talk about them today, as well as some other things, but yeah, let's talk a little football, shall we? You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I'm also the host of Out of Bounds. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 1 to 4 on 103.7 The Buzz and 1037thebuzz.com. Hope everybody's having a wonderful Tuesday as there are plenty of things to talk about here in the sports world. And honestly, it's uh, it's kind of crazy to think that college basketball officially came to an end last night, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, later in the podcast and, and everything. But uh, first, I wanted to bring up something that I think is very important that maybe uh, hasn't been brought up enough, or maybe it's something that just hasn't been on the radar for a lot of Razorback fans, and maybe they just haven't cared as much. But it has to do with spring football. Uh, spring football has been going on. It has been transpiring. You're right in the middle of it. Uh, the spring game, uh, the red-white game, whatever you want to call it, is actually uh, coming up a week from this Saturday. And, you know, I, I thought about this. When uh, I was just kind of going through and looking at some practice reports on hogsports.com and, uh, you know, listen to Trey Biddy and, and some of the stuff he does, as well as some other media members in Arkansas, who's actually been up there covering because I've been gone for uh, what seems like weeks now from for Vegas and Des Moines and Nashville and all that. So haven't really been able to keep up as much as I'd like. But when I was just checking out all the reports and everything, it, there was just, you know, you had injury updates, you had guys, okay, well, this guy's looking good, this guy's who's developing and and everything, but when I kind of went on social media and wanted to talk about it a little bit more and discussing maybe some of the things that, uh, you know, what people were talking about, I guess, with Razorback fans and uh, things that they wanted to know and all of that. And I had some discussions with them and I, I simply asked a, a few fans, and this is also something that I was even at Oaklawn when uh, I was there for the Arkansas Derby, that I was uh, talking to some fans too about football because they were just kind of interested in it and whatnot. And they're like, what, what are the things that we have to do to make sure we don't have what happened last year happen again? And I thought that was really interestingly phrased because, you know, last year, it's amazing how far you've come as a program. Now, I'm not saying that Arkansas is a national championship contender because I still think there's a lot that needs to happen and transpire for that to happen. But it is pretty incredible to think that uh, just how last year you go six, seven and six, I guess, with the bowl victory. You went three and five in conference play. And yet last year was almost looked at as a failure in some people's eyes, like as in just a monstrous travesty. Now, I'm not saying I disagree with that sentiment for anybody to have, because I know that uh, everybody has their own opinion on it. But considering how you went seven and six and where you were just a few years ago and going along with the expectation and, and how close you were to actually being a nine and three team, which I felt like was a reasonable request considering the talent and the schedule last year. Uh, you know, everyone views it just as this disaster. And now you're going into this next year where a lot of people are like, all right, this is this is big for Sam Pittman. This is big for Sam Pittman. Got to change some things. Well, he has changed a lot of things, a lot of things. But going back to the question of what does Arkansas need to do to make sure that last season doesn't happen again? Well, first off, if you've listened to this podcast, you'll know that I believe the schedule is so much more favorable next year for the Razorbacks. I mean, it really is. You have, yes, tough games on the road in conference play. You got to go to LSU, to Alabama, to Ole Miss, and to Florida. Those are your four SEC road games. And then your Fayetteville games, you have Missouri, Mississippi State, and Auburn. And then you have AM and Arlington. And then you have all four of your non conference play uh, games and uh, at home, at least in the state of Arkansas, the first games in Little Rock. But your non conference schedule is easier, 100% easier. It's probably the easiest it's been in quite a while. You're. SEC home schedule are all against teams I feel like you're just as good as or better. I think you're better than Mississippi State. I think you're better than Missouri. I think you're going to be just as good. Like Auburn's kind of a wild card, but still, I know that that doesn't mean you're always going to win because everyone's like, well, you're better than Missouri last year. You lost. Yeah, I know. But just saying on paper and everything, I think you're going to be a better team than those teams. AM, by good grief, who knows? That game's so dumb. But most of the time, you should be better than them. You were better than them last year, but you lost. So, you know, that could be, a, and even the road games, LSU and Bama, I don't see you winning no matter what. Like, those are just tough games no matter where you play them at. 
But, I mean, are you afraid of Ole Miss? You beat the pants off of them last year. You should have beaten them the year before, and you beat the pants off of them the year before. Like, you, Lane Kiffin has not fared very well against the Razorbacks, so that game doesn't scare me. And then at Florida, they got major issues with Billy Napier, and there's no reason for me to believe that they got it going on. So the schedule's easier. But to me, this is like what's going to come down to more so than anything. And because I believe you can take a lot of different stuff and kind of pinpoint, all right, well, this is what I want to see better. This is what I want to see better. Like it, It's easier to do that. But to me, the, the one thing that has to change, has to change, is you have to be able to punch the ball into the goal line when it's first and goal, second and goal, third and goal situations. When you're right there on the goal line, you have to be able to score. Because think about how many times that happened last year where you either didn't get a touchdown, settled for a field goal, or didn't score at all, or had some turnover. How many times that happened in games last year and how pivotal that was in particular games? Needless to say, and needless I bring up, the Texas A&M game with the K.J. Jefferson fumble. Like, from six, first and goal from the six, Arkansas was about to go up 21 nothing. If they do, the game's over. Fumble, return for a touchdown. It's just an indication of what was going to happen that year. Uh, Missouri on the road. You, you wind up with Trey Knox under center on the goal line. Couldn't bust it in. Uh, think about Mississippi State on the road. Opportunities on the goal line. Couldn't bust it in. Those are the things that add up and can be the difference in games. Like we just mentioned how it was the difference in two games specifically with AM and Missouri. Like the difference in those games. You have to be able to punch the ball in. Sounds cliche, sounds easy, but it's true. I I do not want to ever see next. This is and this is what's going to be a really good indication early part next year that if Arkansas is getting first and goal at like the six or first and goal at the four, or first and goal at the eight, whatever it is, and they are having problems getting the ball in the end zone for a touchdown, you're going to see some of the same problems, same crap, same results throughout the year. I uh, I, I just I, mm, just infuriated me, because those are the ones that should be easy. You have a great offensive line, and a great offensive line coach, one of the best in Sam Pittman as a head coach. I think Cody Kennedy is a great one, too. So you got those guys. You got over 500 pounds of absolute men and two players back there with K.J. Jefferson and Rocket Sanders alone. It's not to mention some of the other guys. But you have some big hosses back there that's like a freight train coming at you. Zero excuse that if it's first and goal from the four and you get four shots at it, that you do not score a touchdown. Zero excuse for it. You should be able to run the ball four straight times and get a score that has to change and to me if that changes is that going to go from being a six and six team to a 12 and 0 team no that's not the only thing obviously but that will be the difference in you going six and six and you going nine and three similar to what happened last year so you have to be able to do those things i know the secondary was a major problem too especially in the safety position now they've changed some things to try to get some guys back in there and to uh, not only change coaches, but change personnel, change roster, get some guys out of the portal. And since you were about as bad as you could ever be in college football when it comes to coverage and secondary play and all of that, especially in the past defense, you can't get worse. You can't get worse. And I don't think you will be worse. You have brought in some guys from Baylor. You brought in a guy from Georgia, some four- and five-star guys that are immediately a lot more talented than some of the guys you had on last year. I think you've improved at the coaching position, guy that has a lot of experience in Mark, Marcus Woodson at that safety spot. Uh, I think that you're, you know, you're going to have a lot more athleticism back there. I know you're going to switch up scheme a little bit, but uh, to me, that's what it's more about is just having the talent to go around it. Now, the D-line will be – I think the D-line will be good. I think the D-line will be good. The linebackers – I think we'll take a step. I, I love Chris Poupal. Uh, I know that they're going to have to, you know, continue to build depth. I think missing Drew Sanders is going to hurt. But, um, you know, I think you'll be fine there as long as there's no major injuries, which, geez, knock on wood, that doesn't happen. Uh, so I think you'll be good there. And then I think that, of course, in the secondary, you'll be improved. So when the defense continues to get better, or at least it's trying to get better, I think that alone is going to be what's going to help Arkansas more so than anything. Like just those two things, just those two things. And then finally the offense, which we go, kind of goes back to the whole goal line thing. Um, it's not as simple as getting 
like punching the ball in, it comes down to play calling. Like, and a lot of people wanted to chalk it up to that, but I don't think that was the case as much as what people wanted to make it sound out to be. To me, that's a lot of strength and conditioning. When it comes to they know what you're going to do and you know what they're going to do and you got to be more physical, that's strength and conditioning. And there was an obvious major issue last year with the strength and conditioning coach, and that's been remedied and that's been changed. It was the first thing that got changed. And uh, Coach Souders is the new guy who seems to have uh, a lot of good things going for him, comes from a, uh, a place that was highly recommended and it seems like he's got it going on. So is he going to be tremendously better? Is he going to make it better? We'll see. Time will tell. I will. I believe it'll be better because, again, it's hard to be worse. But that'll be key. But with the offense under Dan Enos, how's that going to look? Because I believe Kendall Bryles had an effective offense. You know, people, again, like to trash him. And, again, I think that uh, the way he handled his uh, his way out was horrible. But um, I think Dan Enos has proven himself time and time again that he is a very – well-renowned, really good offensive coordinator at the SEC level, and he is really good at developing quarterbacks. Every quarterback he's coached has gotten better under him, and so I think K.J. Jefferson, who I already love and already think, already think is great, K.J. is going to be a better quarterback under Dan Enos and with his development. So if you just have those things happen, and I know it's, again, maybe a simple way of putting it, but just getting better at punching the ball in on the goal line, just getting touchdowns when it's first and goal, your secondary being much improved, which I believe it is, and then your offense developing into uh, a more well-rounded, well-executed uh, offense that maybe takes a little bit more risk but gets the higher reward from it too and uh, utilizes the strength of the team, I think everything's going to be better. And on top of that, the schedule, as I mentioned. We'll get closer to the football season. I'll start doing my predictions. But to me, that's some of the most important things. To me, that's the that's the deal that where it'll be the difference in making or breaking your season. And so I can't wait to see how it happens. I mean, I know there's a long way until that happens. But when you're talking about spring football, a lot of that stuff gets addressed here in the spring. So uh, let's hope that that uh, stays that way and doesn't uh, get too crazy either. But uh, we'll talk a little, though, about some uh, some basketball and get into the big week it is for Eric Musselman here in just a second. But we know that even though March Madness has officially ended, uh, the Built March Madness bracket is still here. We know you have your favorite bar or puff, and now it's time to make it count. Go to BuiltMarchMadness.com to vote for your favorites. You know that uh, when it comes to the different flavors, it's hard to choose from them. Anything with cookie dough or anything with chocolate chip, I'm always going to be about. And anytime it's a bar or a puff, I actually prefer the puffs, but the bars are great too, but the puffs are the way to go. Probably going to be voting for that uh, too when, uh, when you go on there. So the best thing about it is that by voting, you will have a chance in a lucky drawing where 50 Locked On listeners will get a free box of Built. And not only that, but one Locked On fan will get a 12-month subscription to Built to have Built's best bars or puffs delivered monthly straight to your door. If you haven't tried Built Bar, you're missing out. It's healthy. It's convenient. It's easy. It's great. It's tasting. I mean, what else could you ask for? It's got 17 grams of protein, only 130 calories. Tastes amazing. It works. It's the way to go. So run to BuiltMarchMadness.com right now to, to vote on your favorite bar or puff and pick up a box while you're there. You can vote every day in March as well as April. So hop in and support your pick. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so continuing on with the Locked On Razorbacks podcast, um, Muss's big week. This is a big week. I know that the college basketball season is now officially over, and we're actually going to have tomorrow on the podcast Curtis Wilkerson of Hogsports.com, who uh, does a phenomenal job of covering all things basketball, Razorback basketball and portals and visits, because there's a lot of kids that are going to be on visits this week for Arkansas, and I think probably by the time we, uh, we record tomorrow, uh, it'll be... It'll be pretty good to uh, see some of the guys and get, get excited about the dudes that Muss is going to be bringing in because I think he's going to you're going to be pretty impressed by the list. But uh, this is a big week for him because if you've looked at some of the way too early top 25s that uh, ESPN and CBS puts out, and like I think it's so dumb. I mean, I get it because we're talking about it, but it's great for content, but it's dumb in reality. Uh, they have they both have Arkansas at number 12 preseason. I'm like. Man, listen, I'm I'm happy for that. I'm I'm thankful. That's awesome. But what? Uh, based on what? You have no idea what this team's gonna look like next year. I don't know. Like, 
you're talking about the only players that have made any sort of announcement on what they're doing or anything has been Nick Smith, who's moving on, Trevin Brazil, who's coming back, and then Devo Davis, who says he's going to test the NBA waters but could come back if he wanted to. That's it. Those are the only ones that have made their presence known, or at least their intentions known. We know that I, I mean, I'm still waiting on Anthony Black. Surely he's going to go to the NBA. You know, Ricky Council waiting on him. Mitchell Twins waiting on them. You know, some of the other freshmen. Like, it's all like, okay, so you're, you're basing it on, I guess, those guys. That, hey, well, who's on the roster now? And then we'll adjust it as it go. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But what I do know is that this is a big week. And this is a big week because this is where the difference of being an average team to being a second weekend team in the NCAA tournament or beyond really comes into play for Eric Musselman. If you think about each and every year that Muss has been at Arkansas and, of course, gone to the Elite Eight twice in the Sweet 16, if you look at all of that uh, and take it into the same perspective of, all right, what made those teams great? Because they were all different. You always had transfers that ended up being a, a major difference or at least the difference of sitting you over the edge. In his first year, Justin Smith and Jalen Tate, big-time difference makers. Obviously, Moses was the star. Devo and Jalen Williams were great freshmen coming off the bench. J.D. Note was a, was a great complimental piece, too, but who was also, I guess, technically a transfer. But you still, had, um, you still had those two guys in Tate and Smith, huge difference makers. And then next year, you know, we talked about all the transfers, like Audis, Tony, Stanley Amude, you know, the differences that they made, even though Note was the star. Jalen Williams was, was awesome. You know, Devo was a complimentary piece, too. But the guys that set you over the edge was Audis Tony with his defense and Stanley Amude with his uh, with his development as the year went on in his offensive game. And then this past year, even, you know, Ricky Council was a huge difference maker, especially in the NCAA tournament. Like he was he was a big time player. I mean, you had him. You had, uh, of course, uh, you know, the Mitchell twins when they had their games here and there. Uh, you know, I think, again, Mikai Mitchell played really well in postseason. So I think that was very important, and very pivotal uh, to his, you know, taking that next step, too. But uh, you know, you had guys like that that were just able to take on that role and be great about it and be a difference maker when it came to uh, the team and themselves. So uh, you had some pieces, some very important pieces there. And now this year, you know, we know who the freshman that you have coming in. We still don't know officially who's going to be coming back, but we do know that the transfers are going to be the difference. They're going to be the ones that are going to take you over the edge. You know, we know that they need shooting. They're going to need some bigs. They're going to need some guys there, too. Um, I would love to see him have another distributing point guard. I, I know I keep bringing it up and people are probably tired of it, but I would love to see another Jalen Tate. Like I'm serious. That guy I think was undervalued and I, I loved Anthony black. Like he, Anthony black was elite. He was awesome, but you're not going to get an Anthony black. He was such a unique player at this upcoming season. So just get you a guy who is a tall point guard with great defense, experienced guy. Who's a good distributor. Like, he doesn't have to score all the time. He doesn't have to be a great three-point shooter. It, it'd be nice if he was all those things, but you just got to get a guy that can be that that leader and that uh, vocal dude that, you know, takes it and helps the teams get to the next level. So uh, I, I'm just – I'm excited to see who Muss is going to bring in. I'm excited to see uh, what they come up with, and I'm excited to see what, uh, what Muss does in the magic and the portal because there's a reason why uh, John Rothstein calls him the importer – because he he's a, he is an importer, like he imports great players and he makes them even better. So, uh, but I guess we'll have to wait and see this week. But again, Curtis Wilgerson will join us tomorrow. He'll give us a big uh, idea, at least a better idea of what we're looking at and uh, what to expect out of Arkansas too. So it should be pretty exciting. But we uh, we will talk about the national championship games. I think there's some interesting points to bring up uh, about UConn winning it all in the next segment. So stay with us here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so final segment here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Uh, the national championship game happened last night. UConn, I, I don't want to say they beat the brakes off of San Diego State, but they certainly won handedly. I think San Diego State got it as close as five in the second half, but just... Big play after big play. UConn was a force to be reckoned with. They were just a monster from beginning to end of the NCAA tournament. Nobody was beating them. 
and it was just their year. Now, give them all the credit in the world. Like they, they were awesome, and they were a fun team to watch. They really didn't have a weakness. They had great inside presence. They were great defensively. They were a great shooting team. They were really smart. Like if you saw how many times that even like late in the play clock or in the shot clock, they were able to you know find somebody open or, or just make the right play when the other team was playing great defense. It was very disheartening for that defense, but great for UConn. Like just putting all those things together, it was a great run for them. It's just unfortunate that Arkansas happened to be one of their victims. Like. It was just, it sucked because after you beat Kansas, you know, you, you just, you're flying high and rightfully so. Now we could all play the woulda, coulda, shoulda game. We, we could do that. But, and, and I'm sure some of you are going to laugh at me and, and call me a homer about, you know, fanboy, whatever that is. Uh, you, you know, you call me every name in the book and that's fine. But I've talked to, to other people too. I've talked to my buddy, Aaron Torres, who was a UConn grad and uh, he was very happy with the result. I talked to a lot of different national people too. And at the end of the day, I believe that if Arkansas did not have to play UConn, they may have been a Final Four team. Now, again, woulda, coulda, shoulda, we'll never know. It doesn't matter. They don't hang banners for that. I get it. But that's how good UConn was, and that's how unfortunate it was for Arkansas that they had to play UConn during that stretch. Because after beating Kansas and the way that Arkansas was confident and the way that you know Muss and had done a great job in the second weekend too, especially in the Sweet 16 games, I looked at the other matchups and the other teams, and I'm like, Arkansas may have beaten pretty much everybody else in that field in the Sweet 16. I would have felt confident about. And I felt confident about UConn because we still felt like, okay, well, they haven't played. But once you saw, it was like, no, 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 this is another animal. This is a whole new deal. And so if Arkansas just would have not had to play UConn, they could have been an Elite Eight Final Four team. I believe that. They were good enough. They were hitting their peak. They were hitting their stride. They had all the confidence in the world. But... When you have a team that's just on a mission like that, like UConn, you got to tip your hat to them. And it just goes back to with the whole thing with the NCAA tournament more so than anything is that it's all about matchups and it's all about playing your best and it's all about a little luck on your side. It's all about all of those things because that's what matters the most. That's what matters the most is about doing all those things and because like UConn, UConn was a four seed. Anybody watch that team? Be like, oh yeah, it's a four seed. No, absolutely not. But they got it going on. If Arkansas would have been on the other side of the bracket, they may have faced UConn in the national championship. They may have. But you know what would have happened? They would have lost because UConn, again, was just too tough. It was too tough. So again, tip the hat to him. It's unfortunate, but I believe Muss is going to get there. He's going to get it done. Congrats to UConn and Dan Hurley. I actually root for the guy. I don't root for many people that, uh, of course, I use a funny picture with him in the in the graphic there, but I actually like him. I think he's a good coach. I think uh, he's fired up and he's energized, and I think that's awesome. And I've always kind of liked UConn. I like Jim Calhoun. Uh, I always thought, you know, Kevin Ollie just, you know, got a flash in the pan type of deal that year. But how incredible is that? Three championships with three, or I guess five championships with three different coaches in 20 years, 25 years. That's insane. And you can't bring it up. It's like, well, that was what LSU did in football. Okay, that's a little different because in football, LSU is one of the best jobs in the entire country, far and away, with money, recruiting, facilities, fan base, in the SEC, major conferences, all that. Like, I'm not saying it's easy, but doing it at UConn basketball is a completely different thing because you had to replace a Hall of Fame coach who had been there forever, and they still got a championship with a coach in Kevin Ollie who wasn't that great anyways. And then this coach with Danny Hurley getting it done like that that's just that's next level stuff folks that's next level they don't have all the money that you would have in an sec or in a you know a major conference you know the recruiting everyone's like well recruiting's really good up there in the northeast well yeah but you know how many schools are up there in the northeast trying to get the same guys it's not as easy as what it looks but arkansas will be back next year it'll be fun it'll be great but just unfortunate they had to play uconn in this particular game that's for sure Appreciate everybody listening in to Locked on Razorbacks podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast here on iTunes or on Google Play. And also on YouTube, folks, hit that like button for me uh, because, uh, I don't know, I would really like you to. And it would be nice if you did. So hit that like button. Uh, and I would appreciate it, too. And we'll keep it moving as uh, we'll have another podcast tomorrow. Again, Curtis Wilkerson, join us at hogsports.com. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you then.